everyone. Welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's community talk show. Our guest today is Christy Turner. Christy is a born leader. She served in the military for 31 years with deployments in Afghanistan and Kuwait. And back home here in Dummerston, she helped to establish Turner and Murnau Tree Service and Landscaping Services. She's also, she has also been an avid hockey player and coach in the Brattleboro area. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show. Glad to be here. So we have some ground and some years to cover today. Um, and um, I'm interested in knowing where, where did you grow up and I, what was your family like? I grew up outside of Boston mm -hmm. in a small bedroom community called Holliston. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I grew up with my four brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm in the middle. I'm mm -hmm. the fifth. Went to high school, all the, all the schools up to high school there in Holliston. Mm -hmm. You're also a twin, I believe. Yes, I am a twin sister, and it's been wonderful having a twin. That's interesting. Abs absolutely. I, I love all my brothers and sisters, but yeah. you have a closer connection with a twin. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah. yeah. I know. I think those of us who are not twins, which is most of us, are a little fascinated by that relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're fraternal. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We look like sisters, uh -huh. but not like identical That's twins a at all. Thing. Yeah, we, yeah, we became our own selves. It was very encouraged by our parents to, uh, be, uh -huh. to be who we wanted to be. And growing up with five kids in the family, what yes. was that dynamic like? Oh, it was great. Um, my mom taught us uh, at a young age, um, if, we, if we teamed up together, there was a lot that we could accomplish. Mm. And, and we still practice that today. Uh, being that we have a summer home together with all my brothers and mm -hmm. sisters that was in the family but has been under our care for the last 28 years. Mm -hmm. So as siblings, the name of the cottage is the meeting house. So uh, we carry on a lot of the traditions that my mom felt strongly about and mm -hmm. enjoy it today as much as we had then. That's so great. So it's been ongoing all these years that yes. you meet there? Yes. What a wonderful thing. And where is it again? It's in Saco, Maine, uh -huh. in a little fishing village called Camp Ellis. All of our children um, look forward to it, so it's great for the cousins as yeah, well. Yeah. And it's the uh, where the fifth gen uh, the children will be the fifth generation. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. so yes, that's very cool. And your mother um, implanted in you uh, the the goodness of hard work and working together. <laughs> My mom was very creative, had visions for so many things, and yes, um, for example, at the cottage, if she said, oh my, the, it's, it's leaking, we need to put a new roof on, um, you know, my, my brother, my older brother, we called him the GC, and to this day, we still call him the GC, <laughs> and, uh, and so we all rallied together, and whether you're throwing up pieces of plywood or nailing down or going mm -hmm. to the hardware store, getting all this stuff, everybody contributes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we accomplish uh, so much, and it feels good. And we do Thanksgiving together, mm -hmm. and we do Christmas, a Vermont Christmas in January. They come here, and we do our Vermont Christmas oh, nice. uh, here. So we do a lot of fun things. That's nice. Yeah. Um, what were your interests like when you were growing up? <laughs> I was very athletic, so mm -hmm. sports was yeah. definitely um, an area that I excelled in and enjoyed. Uh, my brothers were also athletic. My two younger sisters weren't as much. Mm -hmm. um, and my father was a coach in many sports, mm -hmm. and uh, hockey being one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our earlier years, he was a teacher at a prep school. So we had access to mm -hmm. playing around, but we were pretty young then. But yeah. it gave us a good start. Yeah. And my brother, my brothers would build this ice rink in our backyard. And so we would have nets and all kinds of gear yeah. and we would just go out and, and pass the time away uh, doing some kind of sporting event. Yes, right. In the yeah. backyard. You had a team. With we had a kids. team. <laughs> it didn't take much. The neighborhood was definitely easy to corral friends oh, for sure. Great. So you go on to college and what, you were studying things that had nothing to do with what you ended up doing pretty much, right? Well, actually, uh, a botanist. Oh, botany, right. And yeah, coastal yeah. ecology. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I live in Maine under the coastal ecology umbrella and Ran a business under the botany umbrella, if uh -huh. you will. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I went to UMass Amherst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you did something at UMass. You were the town conservationist for Amherst. How did you find uh, that? I do my research. You did, <laughs> yes. Um, I, yeah, I really became, I realized how much I was attracted to the outdoors. Yeah. And that's why that major became important to me, mm -hmm. is that I really wanted to carry through a profession outdoors mm -hmm. um, and not work inside and, uh, in any type of real business 
strong business atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I went to, and so my first job outside of UMass was uh, working for the town of Amherst. Was it interesting? It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. It, um, you know, the, uh, I, I, I was able to manage a thousand acres there for the town of Amherst, and I worked under, um, I had great leadership. P Peter Westover was, was phenomenal. And, um, and you can probably sense that the town of Amherst is a very educated town. So mm -hmm. I really learned a lot um, mm -hmm. and how to be on your feet mm -hmm. and just really keep, keep learning. Mm -hmm. And so I really enjoyed that and trails and all those other pieces that were, right. were part of it. My roommates from college were also people that grew up in Holliston. Mm. And uh, there was eight of us and six of them were in the military. And wow. so... Um, in ROTC at UMass. Mm -hmm. And as we were finishing up our education, I think after three years of me asking a lot of questions about the military, me trying to decide, does the military run our country? Does big business run our country? Mm -hmm. And eventually, since these people knew me really well, it wasn't hard for them to challenge me um, and got right to the point. Um, Chrissy, we're, we're not going to defend anymore. The military, you need to join and see what it's about. The military needs good people, and it's nice to have, um, it's nice, we found it to be an amazing experience. So stop talking about it and go in and check it out. <laughs> and, and so I did, and my junior year, I enlisted in the, into the Army. I did three years enlisted, mm -hmm. and, um, and then decided after college that um, I wanted to um, become an officer. Oh. And so I went to Massachusetts Military Academy mm -hmm. and I graduated from OCS uh, as a second commission, a second lieutenant. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you liked it. You got in there and you, you liked it. I did. I thought the military was amazing. They have, um, they really uh, train you at mm -hmm. every level. So every time you move up in a rank or in a position, there's training involved. Mm -hmm. So they just throw you into things. Mm -hmm. and um, And the training is amazing and then later on as I developed as an officer I just found that the leadership was was um, mentored me so beautifully I had a uh, good good people mm -hmm. and um, and it was just a great experience uh, for me yeah but it was not just about about um, strict military training they were also training you to use your skills and use your intuition I would assume and management there's a management. whole piece in the mm -hmm. in there that's a, a management piece mm -hmm. that was um, extremely um, well it developed so mm -hmm. you you every rank you go up you have more responsibility mm -hmm. it's always a, a different job in some sense, so you're always mm -hmm. introducing yourself, let's say, to a, a new company, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, um, and then so that management level is uh, was very interesting, and they put a lot of time into training you mm -hmm. so that you can manage, and then not only manage but also perform under duress and difficult situations. Right, right. So if you succeed, it really is a very amazing path to take and rewarding. Very. Yes, mm -hmm. right. So you went up the ranks and, and at each stage you were developing in these different ways and getting these skills and all. Um, and did you have an idea at that time what the end game was or what you were going to be doing with this? No, I didn't. I just knew that I lived a very dual life, mm -hmm. if you will. I lived I'm one foot in the civilian world, and it balanced the other foot in the mm -hmm. military world, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I didn't put any expectation mm -hmm. on what an end result would be. Mm -hmm. I just, um, I just participated. Yeah, you know, in both. So yeah. So you had the business going, starting and going on in Dummerston. Correct. And then how how often would you go back and forth? Well, because I belong to the National Guard for the first 24 years, mm. you go once a month and then you meet uh, one or two Wednesdays in the middle of the week, as well as your two weeks, uh, whatever your active duty um, mission would be. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. So you were going through officer training as a reserve, in the reserves. Correct. So that you were pretty much living at home and then going at these different times for the meetings. Right, and yeah. that's how a lot of the school is set up for National Guard and uh -huh. reservists. In other words, they set it up where instead of taking three months or four months, I, I mean, I was in other programs where I was in, in there full time, like at Aberdeen Proving Ground, I was there for mm. six and a half, seven months straight. Mm. So there are programs that 
um, that you can uh, possibly have that are set up that way. But since they realize as you go up further in rank also that you're, also, you're living a civilian life as well as a military yes, life. Yes. And so you have the same requirements, but they're designed differently. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, you'll go to the post, the military post where the school is, you'll spend a summer there. And then when the summer part is over, then you go back and you're doing online pieces mm. or, or something of that nature. And mm. then you go back the following summer and you finish it off. So they do it in phases uh -huh. as opposed to a condensed, um, mm -hmm. what they do for the active component. Mm -hmm. So when you describe sort of being in two worlds, and you're raising your kids as yes. well as the business. Yes, yeah. I love I loved raising my children. I love them every single age, even today. It's uh -huh. just been so much. It's been great. Yeah, yeah. How'd you do with balancing those worlds? I think the more you threw at me, the um, the more I enjoyed it. In really? a sense that um, the challenges always made me grow. Mm -hmm. The challenge of being there for my children, going to their sporting events reading to them at night, mm -hmm. um, whatever the, the circumstances were, and then tuck them in at nine and then continue on with, wow. uh, you yeah. know, whatever might be the, the loose ends that needed to be tied up yeah. at the end of the day. So the pace um, was fast, but um, yeah. it was challenging. Mm -hmm. And in that in itself made it rewarding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were balancing two different worlds. I definitely was yeah. balancing two different yeah. worlds. Like, and one world didn't really know anything about the other. <laughs> They're very different. Yeah. You know, I could be planting a tree one day and then at uh, you know, the National Training Center in California the next. I mean, yeah. it, it was a very different uh, existence. So that's really asking for a real kind of flexibility within yourself to be right. able to do that. I found that it made me very balanced. It made me mm. appreciate, one, being a mother and uh, a wife as well as a business owner here in the community. Mm -hmm just that sense of community and then being extracted from that and being put into a situation that wasn't that sense of community yes, right. in a way and um, being handed some pretty uh, stressful uh, jobs, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, I just found them to be great. And coming home, there's that piece going on I-91 between Northfield and Brattleboro, mm -hmm. exit one, mm -hmm. where I have been coming home on that road for 31 years, and every time I saw that view, it just yeah. quickened my heart, yeah. and I couldn't wait to, you know, go to the Dummerston Town Meeting, uh -huh. <laughs> Town uh -huh. Meeting Day, uh -huh. or, or something that was just like, wow, this yes. is this is pretty neat. But then at some point you were deployed, right? Or did it, were the uh, deployments around? Well, I was deployed this? to a combat zone, so that makes uh -huh. any other deployment seem different. But yes. yeah, so a combat zone, you're when you get deployed to combat, it's right. for length, it's for length of time. Yes. So the active component does six months, or did when I was in, in Afghanistan on the whole year of 2013, mm -hmm. where a reservist and a National Guard mm -hmm. do a year. Mm -hmm. So my year deployment, and a, a regular army is six months. So. I would be working with two different regular army people as colleagues mm -hmm. during my one year um, uh -huh. deployment. So you didn't go to Afghanistan until 2013? Correct. Oh, so that was, the war was well on by that time. You would think. You, you, you wouldn't have known that by being in combat. Can you talk a little bit about that time for you? In Afghanistan. It being there in, in, during combat, yeah. Well, I, I really liked my mission a lot in Afghanistan. So for me, coming out of European headquarters, which was a strategic level headquarters that I was in for uh, six years, seven years, hmm. um, and then being deployed to Afghanistan with RCENT, Army Central, um, my job there was very, it was, it was wonderful. So I've had some experience at European headquarters that allowed me to really have a very visible job in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. And so my job in Afghanistan was to disposition all the equipment down to the brigades as they came in. So in my year times, 27 brigades came in. And because we were withdrawing our numbers, meant that there was a retrograde that was happening for the first time. And so we had to reverse our our thought process for logistics. Mm -hmm. And so that meant instead of stuff coming in, we wanted it all to go out. Right. And, um, and that was a very interesting time to do retrograde. Um, so it was interesting enough that Dan Rather 
came and interviewed ah. the generals I was working for. Really? So what was it about, about that, about the, that, that uh, action that was so different, and why would someone like Dan Rather come in to take a look at that? Well, we, we understand Dan Rather to be very experienced when it comes to theaters of war, mm -hmm. right, in the 80s and such. He's, he's just one of those journalists that have been yeah. part of man, many of these type things. So he realized what we knew as an army um, a field army what was happening and that is that when you remove the people you don't have all of it, it's easy to remove people mm. it's very difficult to remove equipment from a place that has one one decent road structure and you're working in a different a different realm of uh, an operation than we have in previous wars where you're actually working with the population mm -hmm. so you're working with the the Afghan population to help you move your things on the road networks. Ah. And so um, so seeing that, I think it would caught his interest. Yeah. And then to move to have this mandate when it comes down from the commander in chief, um, he understood what that might entail. Mm -hmm. There's 243 bases at the time I was there. Mm -hmm. And if you remove your personnel, then you don't have what you need to, to even dissemble them. Right. And then uh, to remove things from theater, if you only have one road, then the only other way is air. Because you're in 26,000 foot elevation mountains and you have no port, no seaport, yeah. right? Yeah. So that was very, it was, it, was, it was like getting your doctorate degree in, in logistics. In logistics, And so yes. to me, that was, right. that was really a height for me to mm -hmm. operate under those circumstances. And I really thrived you at did. doing that job. Yeah, I really liked it. I would assume that there are certain people who are excellent at this and some that you would not want to be doing it. I mean, I don't claim to be the brightest light bulb in the pack. There's a lot of amazing leaders out yeah. there, but I also had a very strong work ethic. Yeah. And if I didn't have the answer, which kind of got known mm -hmm. by my colleagues in Kuwait, that uh, I would get it. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and same with my commanders. If I didn't have it, they knew I would strive to get that answer. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that, was, that was a good thing. Wow. Um, I was deployed from January 2013 to January 2014, mm -hmm. and then on my arrival home, I ended up being diagnosed with PTS, and so I went to the uh, the um, Warrior Transition um, Hospital up in at Fort Drum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How was that? I have to say, an active duty post very similar to um, Mead Medical Center is amazing. What they do for soldiers in a in a active component post. Mm -hmm. It's um, the medical facilities are all there mm -hmm. and every day is there for you to uh, make appointments and get well. Mm -hmm. And so they, that's what they do within a military structure. Mm -hmm. So you were able to go through that and come out on the other side? I, I went through that and realized at that time at that medical facility that PTS just doesn't leave you, it stays with you. Mm -hmm. And so this was now gonna be a lifetime challenge for me mm -hmm. to learn to understand PTS. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it was very, very painful. Mm -hmm. It was a very painful uh, experience to have PTS. Mm -hmm. And when you were there at Fort Drum, did you feel that um, you were getting the kind of care that you needed? Did you feel that they were able to address your issues? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. they were. They again. You're you're with a team of medical from from everything from doctors to nurses mm -hmm. to physical therapy to um, therapy to yoga mm -hmm. to you know, uh, and and nobody had a, an alibi. Everybody had to participate. Mm -hmm. um, whether you you had a limb missing or not, it didn't mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. You were up at six o'clock in the morning, and um, so they they kept you engaged mm -hmm. as you. Uh, a lot I don't remember yeah. um, because of the, the, the severity of my PTS, but I, I do realize that they did try to keep us busy and they used alternative things as well. Mm -hmm. um, their therapies, uh, their physical therapies, their yoga, their swimming, mm -hmm. uh, just, yeah, so they, it was different than I had expected it yeah. to be, and, and I was pleasantly pleased. <laughs> oh, that's good. So, yeah. so their, their response to mental, mental problems, mental illness... I think they understand how many people have PTS that come out of these combats. So if we've been, uh, you know, we've been here engaged in these operations for 18 years, mm -hmm. and so there's a there's a there's a large number of invisible wounds, mm -hmm. and um, statistically speaking, we lose 22 soldiers a day uh, a, a week. 
yeah. a day, a day, I'm sorry, we lose 22 soldiers a day to suicide, to suicide. which is twice the amount of the right. civilian sector. Yes. And 87 percent of combat veterans come back and, and, and are become divorced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you have more people dying from the collateral damage of combat mm -hmm. outside of combat than mm -hmm. you do inside combat, right. then you really have a problem. And so these medical facilities are very aware of the statistics. Mm -hmm. So going through all that, do you, and knowing you know about the collateral damage when people get home, um, do you feel that there's a mental illness stigma within the Army itself? And that's a really good question. And um, I have found that the military tries to train against stigma. Mm. Um, but I think when you're operating at these high levels and you have these security clearances that are um, that you need in order to carry on your job um, and to get to the next rank and all these other pieces, I'm not sure if it's fully um, as as they would like with no stigma. I think there mm -hmm. still is a stigma to it, and mm -hmm. um, they're getting better. Mm -hmm. So they're, it's improving. They're becoming more aware. Yes. 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 Yeah, so you get home. You get back to Dummerston. And you haven't been here long, and you're, you're, you've come out of uh, quite a bit of, of work and therapy mm -hmm. at Fort Drum. So yeah. how is it to land back here? Uh, it was still kind of confusing a little bit for mm. me. Um, I missed my family so much because at this time it was 17, almost 18 months of being away from my family. Mm. And so, you know, you have to balance what makes you whole, and being with my family made me whole. So, um, But when you come back here, it is hard. Um, it is hard for the community to understand, one, that you can't just shut off right. all that adrenaline that's been in you for a year to keep you alive. And two, that invisible wound is really um, hard to detect, but yet at the same time, as an individual, the pain was immense. Mm -hmm. And you worked with Ann Black with the Warrior Connection. I did. I also in Dummerston. Yes. yes, and boy, what a lucky thing mm -hmm. to have the Warrior Connection in Dummerston at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I had done other things prior to that, and all of them may have helped, but none of them removed the pain. Mm. And so, you know, as I had mentioned before, I had done the yoga. Um, I also had, uh, you know, was in therapy still, mm -hmm. and um, exercise was extremely important, so the moving piece. But, um, but the pain, you know, you, you suffer, I guess. And um, I didn't want to do medication. I didn't want to ever drink mm -hmm. alcohol. I wanted to see how to work through that suffering. Mm -hmm. And the Warrior Connection truly helped me do that. It did. Yes, it did. And this is like profoundly. I mean, like <laughs> night and day. <laughs> and this is like a one-week workshop. It's six well. days, and there's many out there. So there's yeah. forty-two thousand of these offered in the United wow. States because there is this gap of, right. of you can do all the therapy and all the yoga yeah. and all those other pieces, but there's something internally that mm. just needs a, a specialized uh, transition, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so there's many of these programs that fill the gap, and, and many of them are run by military people who have experienced the same, the same lack of, yes. of uh, direction, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a desperate time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's a desperate time. You know, when you think about it too, you know, um, Obviously, war has been going on for eons, and think of all of the soldiers who have come back after war and what they've gone. I mean, I, I don't think that PTSD has probably changed all that much over the centuries, right? It isn't. It used to be called battle fatigue. Or shell shock. Or right? shell shock. All of those have yes. been certain certain criteria towards mm -hmm. it, yes. Mm -hmm. But when you come back and people don't even realize that Afghan all of Afghanistan is a combat zone, right. then they're not picturing you that way at all. They, mm -hmm. they may be picturing you... I don't know, sitting at a desk, um, you know, signing out trucks or something. I, I really don't we know. We don't know. Yeah, we don't and, know what you've done. And all of all of Afghanistan is a combat zone. There's no right. such thing as a front line anymore. Uh, wow. Is there a camaraderie when you get together with other veterans? There is, and I had a very profound healing experience based on that, mm. actually. Um, and, uh, you know, that was very interesting. I mm. went to one of those programs, another one called Sempify Odyssey, run by a two-star Marine General, mm -hmm. Tom Jones, an amazing giver, if you will, from the heart as well. Um, and there in that, this woman came up to me and said, I, I, I recognize you. And I'm like, what? Yeah, she had 40 years of service, 20 as enlisted, 20 as officer. And she said, I recognize you from Afghanistan, and I'll always remember you because you walked up that 
you walked on that road up there on Disney fully confident, all battle rattle on, and I just remember that, and I needed, I needed to see that, and I did. Yeah. And that's how come I remember you. And I'm like, no way. And sure enough, we found out we were there um, during something very bad that happened to mm -hmm. some soldiers. And, um, and it was something that I was never able to share with anyone mm -hmm. because I had gone into this deployment as an individual um, and not with any company or battalion or anything. Oh. So, so I experienced this horrific day <laughs> and I had no one to share it with and I didn't realize it. But as soon as I saw her there, we never discussed it. But we made this eye contact of, of immense healing, like there's another human being that understands that moment, mm. that, that insanity, mm. and that mm -hmm. suffering. Mm. And, and it just washed out of me. Wow. And um, yeah, so we never had to say a word. And it was, that's, that's what happens when you're with other military people. Yeah. There's a common ground there that's understood, that can't be understood here in Dummerston. No, no, right. and for any of us who have never been in that kind of situation, we don't know, we can have all kinds of opinions and ideas about war, but we don't know what it's like when you're out there. No, and I just want to say, I vowed when I got out of Afghanistan alive that if I did, I would speak for all the young mm -hmm. men and women who have serviced um, for OEF and OIF and other operations as well in the past, but these young people, I found them to be amazing, professional, amazing mm. soldiers, mm -hmm. and, and I just want to say that um, I'm here for because of them. Oh, yeah, and for them, I would imagine. Exactly, too. Yeah, that yeah, as yeah. well. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and also, Christy, I think, you know, that um, I know that you've been working on pr different presentations and um, coming on the show and, and things like that, and, and so I would... And also going through the warrior connection, you know, mm -hmm. and having, yes. you know, having had that experience, um, I know that you want to you want to be out there more in public. I think, right? I do. And, yeah, I talk do. Talk about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like I'm a vessel for um, for that mm. for some message here mm -hmm. uh, in regards to what it means to have PTS, whether it's a family member that you see struggling with right. it, whether it's a sibling, whomever it might be, that you know there is an offer of hope and. And I can only share through my experience, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that it reaches people. Mm -hmm. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. And I, Thank you. And I, but I also think that you know you have you have the spirit, and again the the qualities that come with leadership oh. to be able to present that way. You Thank know, you. And to know that um, to know that there's someone who's been there, I would assume would be extremely um, comforting. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well. We appreciate it. We appreciate what you're doing. Thanks. Um, and where you've been. Um, and also the fact that you were a great hockey coach, right? <laughs> <laughs> I had great kids, and I had them for eight years, so it was wonderful to watch them grow. And uh -huh. they, became, they became pretty dedicated to the sport. And some of them are still playing today, so that's, that's that's nice. That's Again, another great team effort, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love team. <laughs> yeah. Go team. Go team. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Christy. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me oh, here. Thanks for being on the show. It's okay. great to have you. It's a pleasure. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. Um, it was wonderful having Christy on the show and hearing what she's talking about. So tune in next week. Um, we will have yet another guest from our Brattleboro area to come on and tell their story. See you then. <laughs>